the next category would be the um, the truths that fall under musculoskeletal mm-hmm. health. Yes. All right. So there's two things we're asking people to measure here, and that is grip strength and bone mineral density. We know that uh, as we age, there are age-related changes to uh, skeletal muscle and also to our bone. And this is this is important for a few reasons. One is that um, strength of our muscles and our ability to produce force and also the strength of our bones affects our risk of falls and fractures. Fractures are not a leading cause of, of death, but if you have one, there's a very high mortality rate. I think it's 25%. If you fracture your hip, there's a a 25% mortality rate in the first year and 80% within the three to four years after that hip fracture if you're aged 65 or older. Because of the domino effect that occurs as a result of that fracture. Right, and if we want to prevent falls then, or fractures I should say, then that really boils down to two things. We want to prevent someone from falling in the first place and if they do fall, we want them to have strong bones so they don't fracture. So we can get a very uh, good understanding as to what someone's sort of global uh, total body strength looks like with a grip strength test. This seems to be quite indicative of overall body strength. It's not that grip strength itself is magical and is the kind of longevity hack. We're not going to ask people to go away and do wrist curls um, necessarily. But grip strength is highly predictive of mortality. It's highly predictive of cardiovascular disease. We know that for every five kilogram reduction in grip strength, you have a 16% increased risk of premature death. And that's that strength, and we can go as deep as you want, but that is that is dictated by uh, a number a number of, of factors. It's not just muscle mass. You know, there is strength independent of muscle mass as well. And a lot of that is to do with the chemical and the neural signals that go from the brain to, to the muscle. Mm-hmm. And the, the kind of motor units is what they're called, which is the, the nerves innovating into the, the muscle tissue. We see from the age of about 40, you start to lose 2 3% of uh, strength on a yearly basis, which is, you know, that's a considerable amount of strength to be losing. Yeah, and it accelerates the older you get. You it, know? it accelerates the older we get, but we have to remember that this is looking at populations that are mostly sedentary. So we shouldn't assume that that is just the way it is and these are the age-related changes that are going to occur to our muscle because we know with certain interventions, for example, that you can actually increase the number of those motor units. You can increase the size of the muscle. So there are things that you can do to at least attenuate that loss in strength as you age. A couple uh, thoughts. You mentioned the difference between muscle mass and actual strength. In other words, it's not just about putting bulk on your body, it's about your body's ability to recruit the muscle fibers that you have and to do that efficiently. Those are two different things. And that recruitment can be trained, of course, as can bulk. And grip strength, correct me if I'm wrong, this came up in the podcast that I did with Peter Atia. It's not that you're going to train grip strength, it's that grip strength is a proxy or a way of um, getting a sense of what somebody's overall strength is. Because if you have strong grip strength, you're probably doing lots of things or whatever that are just making you strong and robust. Right, a byproduct of the way that you're living. Yeah. So how do we test for grip strength? We use a dynamometer, which is a... $20 Twenty or thirty dollars. You can just hang from a bar and like you know count to however long it takes until you have to let go. Yeah, that that is a test that's been done, but but probably measures grip endurance more than strength. 
So the dynamometer allows you to look at absolute strength. And it's what's used in these studies where they're looking at grip strength as a predictor of mortality. They're using a dynamometer to measure someone's grip strength. And where do you get one? How do you use it? How expensive is this thing? 20 or $30. I mean, like a lot of things in life, you can go out and you can you can indulge and spend $300. I don't think you need to do that. In, in the challenge, we have a link to one that has been used in studies is about $30 that you can order on Amazon. And you know, the protocol to measure your grip strength is very simple. We outline those four or five steps. You do your left, left side and your right side and you repeat it three times and you take an average. And then you plug that into the, the calculator. Mm -hmm. And what gets factored in there again is age and sex mm -hmm. and you get a score for that. Exactly. Okay. Um, grip strength, uh, what was the other one? Bone mineral density. Mm -hmm. So bone mineral density is measured with a DEXA scan. We know that for, for every one standard deviation below the average bone mineral density of a 30 year old. So every one standard deviation below, which is like a 10% reduction in bone mineral density, you have a doubling of your risk of fracture. The DEXA scan measures your, what's called a T-score. So you get this number that is exactly that. It's measuring you against the average bone mineral density of a healthy 30-year-old adult. And so if your score is zero, that is the average for a 30-year-old adult. If you're minus one, well, you're 10% lower. And at from minus one to minus 2.5 is called osteopenia. So this is the stage before someone is diagnosed with osteoporosis, which is from minus 2.5 and down. On the retreat set we just ran, because we had everyone measure mm -hmm. these 10 truths before they came. And it was you and Drew Harrisburg who were hosting this retreat right. in Bali and you put all of your campers like mm -hmm. through a version of this challenge, yeah? Yeah, we, I mean, we deep dived this entire challenge. We had you know, 90 minute lectures on the cardiovascular system and then on metabolic health and then on psychological well-being, all the things and all, and all the, the 10 truths and what we're measuring and then all of the interventions. But what was, really surprising to three of the, the guests who were all postmenopausal women. Now, postmenopausal women are the, are the highest risk category for osteopenia and osteoporosis. And three of these women who had never done a DEXA scan for the first time were told that they had osteoporosis. And that's important information to know because it can affect the choices you make with your lifestyle. Where are you gonna focus your attention on from an exercise point of view, for example? What parts of your diet do you wanna focus on a little bit more? Is there pharmacotherapy that's important? Um, so you know, measuring these things, they, they have real world consequences, I guess is the point that I'm trying to make here. And a lot of us are floating along sure. through life with really, no idea what's happening underneath the hood. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm one of those people, I think. Um, I've always thought bone mineral density or things like osteoporosis, these are issues that predominantly concern women more than men. Perhaps I'm incorrect in that assumption. I don't know why I even think that or where that came from. And secondarily, that this is something that would be very unusual to be concerned about until maybe you're in your mid fifties in terms of testing and evaluating. So, so that's a two part question. So part, yeah, yeah. part one, you're right. It is more common to see osteoporosis in women, particularly postmenopausal women. There are some other conditions, some pre-menopausal conditions where you can see osteoporosis, um, particularly in, in 
athletes who are restricting energy. Now, why is that the case? The, the simple answer is it's probably driven by hormones. So in that postmenopausal phase, and I did a, a two or three hour episode with Dr. Suzanne Davis on, on menopause where we spoke at length about this, but in that postmenopausal phase, estrogen kind of goes off a cliff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just had Lisa Moscone in here. Right. We did a couple hours on that. And one of the key roles of estrogen is when we load our bone, so you know, the, the two best ways to load bone to stimulate it to grow stronger is you know, weight-bearing exercise where there's some type of ground reaction force that is greater than what we, we would be subjected to just in everyday life. So, so let's say we walk around all, every day. Um, just walking more is not going to increase our bone mineral density, but skipping or hopping or jogging, these types of things where you increase that ground reaction force can stimulate the body to lay down more bone. But hormones are very important for that process and estrogen in particular sort of acts as the signal between the force is recognized by estrogen, it stimulates estrogen, which then stimulates these cells called osteoblasts to produce more bone. Mm -hmm. And so if you have less estrogen around, then you're getting less bang for your buck when it comes to the stimulus of jogging or skipping resulting in that adaptation that you're looking for. But there still is some adaptation. It's there just still not, is some. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's why I mentioned though, uh, pharmacotherapy, because, you know, depending on someone's context, for example, estrogen therapy, it's not indicated for everyone. It's contraindicated for, for some people. Uh, but, but for others, it can be indicated and can be very helpful for things like osteoporosis. Mm, Interesting. And for men, is there a point at which there's no return or is this something where interventions can always lead to improvements? I'm just imagining somebody who gets their bone mineral density evaluated, realizes they're they're way off the mark. Um, Obviously, then you have to worry about fractures, right? So when you're talking about load bearing exercises, that suddenly becomes a precarious, uh, you know, kind of prospect, right? You have to be safe about this, but also engage in it so that you can get that stimulus and and try to regenerate some of that density. And I think this is why you're starting to see these bone health clinics being set up. I'm not sure if you've seen any of them. I haven't seen that. That's a thing. Yeah, it's a thing. And and you can go in and do very specific training to increase your bone mineral density under the supervision because as you say, there there will be a large percentage of the population with low bone mineral density that also, quite frankly, don't have very good balance. And, and, and getting them to do some of these exercises could be dangerous. So I think if you, if you do a DEXA and you have osteoporosis or osteopenia, then that's a time with a physician and hopefully with an exercise physiologist, if you can access one, you create a really robust plan for you. You know, jogging and skipping is not going to be for everyone. It's going to depend on on someone's baseline health and their risk of having a, a fracture. So I want people to, to kind of do this safely. But yes, the body can adapt. There's some beautiful studies looking at 80 and 90 year old subjects. And even at 80 or 90, you can build muscle and you can increase bone mineral density. Okay, so it's not as though it gets too late to, for the body to to adapt to a stimulus. Mm-hmm. It's it still will, but you need to to do that safely. Is the only way to get an accurate sense of your bone mineral density uh, to, is to undergo a DEXA scan? Is there any other way of testing this? I'm just imagining not everybody is going to have access to this kind of technology. How does that work? If somebody does want to get a DEXA scan, how do they even go about figuring that out? There's some other technology, but that doesn't really speak to the accessibility uh, part of your question. So like there's another um, scanning device called the Echo, which is becoming popular. But the, the DEXA scan is by far the marker that is used in clinical research 
to look at risk of fracture. Right. So we know it's a robust. If you measure your T-score, we know that that is a robust marker that can be used along with other risk factors. So there's, we're going a little bit into the weeds here, but if you were in a clinical setting and you had a DEXA scan and you were speaking with your physician and you were trying to work out what's your 10-year risk of a fracture, they have a calculator and they can consider you know, your history of smoking and alcohol and whether you have osteoporosis in your family and, and all those sorts of things get factored in uh, as well. But certainly... This is probably the least accessible of the 10 truths to measure. Uh, I'm aware of that, but I think it's something that everyone should do, but particularly postmenopausal women. And I say everyone because you made a point before about um, you know what happens if you measure your bone mineral density at 50, 60, and it's low. Is there still enough time to, to change that? I think we need to think about our bones like a savings account in a bank. <laughs> and so if we can build that saving up early in life, then mm -hmm. we're less likely to run into issues later in life. So I'm speaking to the young person here now who's 20 or 30 or in their 40s. I don't, I'm not even going to think about this for another 30 years. Yeah, and I'm saying you should approach this as your savings account. So. Um, the interventions that are in the challenge that are, have been included in there to promote bone mineral density should be things that you should try and integrate into your mm -hmm. re regime in advance. On top of all of this, if you do get a DEXA scan, you're getting a window into not just your bone mineral density, but a whole number of things, your visceral fat. Like mm -hmm. there's a lot of data that you can extract from that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and, and visceral fat, I thought about putting that into this, uh, these, these truths that we're measuring, but I feel like it's adequately covered with triglycerides and fasting glucose and HbA1c. Uh -huh. I, I spoke to that earlier. Um, I had my visceral fat measured recently. Yeah, I had it. you say with a twinkle in your eye. Yeah, I can brag about it. <laughs> well, I feel like I can brag about it because I, I, I got so much shit on YouTube and on Instagram for at least a couple of years where um, proponents of an animal-based or carnival-style diet were nagging me to get a DEXA scan, um, saying that you know maybe, maybe I'm, I'm fit and strong on the outside, but with that high-carbohydrate diet probably have a lot of visceral fat mm. being built up. So I was pleasantly surprised to see that my visceral fat was almost zero. Have you made a little video, clapback video about that? I haven't posted anything that is directed <laughs> towards that crowd. I did put uh, some stories up on my Instagram with the, the results, but yeah, maybe, maybe I should think about yeah, that. Interesting. Um, if somebody wants to get a DEXA scan, how do they even go about figuring out mm. where to go and what does that cost and what does that entail? I went to DEXA Fit uh, in Boston, but they DEXA Fit are, are all around the United States. And in, in most countries now, there are studios set up to measure, to do a DEXA scan and a VO2 max often are in the same place. Mm -hmm. So DEXA Fit do both. So if you wanted to to do a treadmill VO2 max test and a DEXA. You know, you're wanting to go all out with measuring your yeah. 10 truths a the, the accurately. Premium, the premium plan. Yeah. yeah. Then you would go to an organization like DEXA Fit or if you're in another country, something that's equivalent. Um, we have a partnership with DEXA Fit so that if people doing this challenge who are based in the United States want to use them, they can get uh, some saving on either the DEXA scan or VO2 max or both if they choose to do both. Right. But in terms of what it costs, um, I probably should know that. I think it's between two or $300. Uh -huh. Oh, I would have thought it would have been more. I that's think it's bad. more if you do both. I mm -hmm. think that's the cost just for the DEXA scan, but don't quote me on that. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, but there'll be a link to the DEXA fit situation in the materials. Uh, for the challenge, right? Mm -hmm. So whatever savings or discount is going to be made available, people can figure that out there. Exactly.